Hey folks, it's uh, 12 o'clock here in Portland where I am today and it's another monthly edition of the Best Places Town Hall with me, Bert Sperling, and um, I have a website called bestplaces.net and in it uh, we try to help you find your own best place to live. Now, I'm an expert about best places to live and what the pros and cons are about all the areas, but everybody's situation is different. And that's why we have a website full of information and we have some partners that help us as well. And we do that to help you find your own best place, realizing that what may be great for somebody else might not be perfect for you. But we're here to try and help you with that and maybe give you some ideas, share some thoughts about what other people have found about places to live, and help you guide your thinking in what it takes to find what's best for you. So, um, it's been a really busy week here at Sperling's Best Places. We had a team meetup uh, last week, right about this time. We were all meeting um, at a conference room here in, in Portland in a place called the Pearl District, where uh, Old Town uh, used to be. And um, so we got together and shared ideas about what we were doing and about uh, future projects to come and what we're going to be doing with the site to make it even more interesting and insightful for you to find, uh, like I said, your own best place. So let's go into some of the things we have been doing. We released the Rock Wrinkle Ranking. Now, Rock, R-O-C, Cosmetics, is you ladies out there are probably familiar with it, uh, but Rock is a cosmetics company. I think it originally started in France, um, and this is our third year that they've asked us to do a study. Uh, they call it the Wrinkle Ranking, comparing different cities with each other. The first year we compared the 50 largest metro areas on the places that are most prone to us. Uh, premature aging and skin damage. And that's so the wrinkle ranking. The second year, last year, we looked at the different states and how they compared. And by the way, these studies are on our website, bestplaces.net. So you can go back and, and find um, what might be interesting for you and some of the insights they provide. This year, they had a particular challenge for us. They wanted us to look into the future, 25 years into the future, the year 2040 and find those places that were most at risk from premature wrinkling. So we looked at a number of different factors. We focused on uh, things like the racial and ethnic makeup of an area, and I'll explain about that in a moment. But we also looked at uh, the incidence of skin cancer, uh, because that's a very good um, glimpse into it. It's an indicator, a metric, uh, has high correlation with skin damage, of course. It's like the worst kind of skin damage. Uh, we also looked at the uh, type of climate, drier, wetter, um, warmer, cooler. Uh, by the way, uh, spoiler alert, every place is getting warmer and that trend is going to continue over the next 25 years. Uh, we also looked at things like uh, commuting uh, trends, and other factors uh, regarding stress uh, that could lead to premature wrinkling. So here's what we found. Uh, we looked at some of the things uh, and we found that Philadelphia was number one on our list, uh, followed by Denver. And these are places that are gonna have more risk involved with their um, skin damage. Seattle, surprisingly, even though it's overcast much of the time and a relatively low altitude, Chicago, Minneapolis, Phoenix, Washington, D.C., New York City is number eight. Then comes the suburb, Detroit suburb of Warren, Michigan, and then Edison, New Jersey, which is sort of a New York City suburb. suburb. Portland uh, comes at number 11, then comes Pittsburgh at number 12. But we have all the rankings on our website, bestplaces.net. Now, I mentioned the social, the racial and ethnic makeup of an area. This is important because, yes, we can apply um, SPF, uh, skin products, uh, sun factor products on our skin um, to help us 
keep the damaging ultraviolet rays from penetrating uh, and making uh, damage in our skin, of course. However, here's the key factor. The main thing that is an indicator of skin damage or say melanoma in, in this case is actually uh, your ethnic background. Folks from the uh, Northern European regions are most at risk. And as if you want to think about it, the lighter the skin color, the more damage a person has at risk. So places that have um, a low incidence of uh, folks of color, uh, places like Minneapolis, Portland, Oregon, um, and those sort of places, they have a higher incidence that's strongly correlated with more melanoma. Now here in Oregon, where I live, uh, we have one of the higher rates in the country of melanoma, and that's in spite of having a really strong cloud cover uh, that is present much of the time. So we're not getting exposed to sun very much, but we do have a high incidence of melanoma. And that's because uh, we have a very um, low percentage of people of color. Uh, so the people least at risk um, in order uh, of, uh, in, de in increasing order of less risk would be uh, Asians, uh, then come uh, Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, and then Blacks. So basically, um, the darker a person is, the less risk they tend to have. Of course, every case is different uh, of uh, skin damage and skin cancer. So uh, that's pretty interesting. The United States is going to become more and more um, they're going to have more color. Uh, we're going to be more racially diverse. We're going to be uh, increasing numbers of Hispanics. And as a result, uh, we're actually going to become less at risk from uh, melanoma and skin disease. So that is uh, an upside to that. So check out our site. It's the Rock Wrinkle Ranking. Just got released. It's pretty interesting how things are going to uh, shake out over the next 25 years. Um, and uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. Anyway, uh, what else are we doing? Um, we are just wrapping up the 11th, 11th year of the Trojan Sexual Health Report Card. Yeah, it's, it's Trojan, it's the condom company. But Trojan has come back to us for 11 years to ask us to do this study because they realize it is so important. They've had really positive results uh, doing this that had got great press. What we do is we reach out to 140 of the largest schools all around the nation, and that represents over 33% of the uh, freshmen or, or of the undergraduate class uh, in the United States. There's 25,000, um, no, I'm sorry, there's around 2,500 colleges and universities, four year schools in the United States. 2,500 schools. We go to 140 because they're, they're, they are the largest schools. We reach over 33% of the um, undergraduate class. And we ask them, uh, well, we look at the resources, materials, and other information that is provided to them so they can make their own healthy, safe, smart decisions regarding sexual health and sexual activity. And because it's very positive, we work with the student health centers. Uh, Trojan really is proud to sponsor uh, this particular project of ours. And we produce a ranking of all the schools every year for the past 11 years. Um, and uh, so it's really quite important to have this information for students. The students appreciate it. They've actually taken the results to their a uh, particular um, administration and say, look, we should be doing better. We need more information. Uh, the the student health centers like it because they get to see how they compare with others across there. And it's a friendly competition to see who can excel. And the parents like it because they know that their students are getting the information. They need to be smart, healthy, and safe. And so uh, anyway, it's a big win-win. We're really proud to do that every year. Uh, it's a very important study.
Uh, again, that's on our site, bestplaces.net. So let's see what else. Oh, before I go, uh, one of the things we had is uh, Bertrand with our, um, uh, he went online and had some really nice sweatshirts made up for us, Sperling's Best Places sweatshirts, hoodies. I like the ones with uh, that are uh, zip up so I can unzip them and be comfortable. Anyway, I'd like to know if you're interested in something like uh, a Sperling's hoodie or some really neat stickers that we have. Uh, I've got some on my laptop. I'm going to put one on my automobile. Um, and uh, maybe next time I drive around the country, everybody can see the Sperling's uh, sticker on my car. So um, if you're interested in some of these things, let us know. We can judge uh, the level of interest. And uh, you can show that you're aware of Sperling's and uh, be proud of it just like we are. But if you're interested, shoot me an email. Um, send me a text or uh, go ahead and put a comment here uh, in the box and uh, maybe we'll go ahead and offer them for sale at a, at a modest price. And um, anyway, but I think it's a really neat logo. Thank you, Bertrand, for doing that. It's a lot of fun. Um, let's see what else we had. Anyway, it was a great meetup we had. So uh, we did some really interesting and fun things coming up. So we are winding up our data compilation. Uh, what we do, this is a lot of work, and but this is really what makes Sperling's website so valuable and interesting and why we get such um, a lot of attention for it. Basically, what we're doing is curating this information all across the nation. Uh, we have about 150 different fields of data, everything from economic data uh, to the um, composition, the demographic background of places, climate information, housing, appreciation of housing, housing prices. Uh, basically, we have all this and we combine it in a way that is comparable clear across the U.S. In other words, uh, every, from the smallest zip code to the smallest town of one or two people, there are some places like there, to counties like Def Smith County in um, Texas. I'm not sure if that's the one, but there's a county in Texas with a population of one or two people. But we even have information for that. And it's all comparable. You can compare it on our website, bestplaces.net. We have these tools. So you can see how different places compare against each other and do your own ratings and rankings. So that's just about done for this year. Uh, a lot of information, but it's really, really worthwhile. So I'm sure you're going to be interested in seeing that when we uh, – finally get that up here in the next couple of weeks. Now, another thing that we have, it's very cool, is we have uh, Jason we're working with, Jason in New York City uh, is working on a mobile app for us. I'm just gonna go ahead and just show you, um, this is what it's going to look like. So we have our, our Sperling's uh, app, and I don't know if this can go ahead and see it very well. Trying to go ahead and show this on the, but what it is, it's a very cool um, app that uh, Jason is working on for us. It's going to enable you as you go around, because it's mobile, we didn't want to just have the same information that we have on our website. It's very useful, but having all that data and all that insight is going to be pretty tough to put on a mobile platform. So we're reducing everything to indices numbers between 1 and 10, and we're rating different areas all around the country right down to the block group level, uh, which is a subset of the um, uh, of, of, a, of a zip code. So when you're driving around, you can press a button, it'll refresh, and it will show you exactly what the housing cost is in that area, what the schools are like, what kind of people live there, what the family composition is, uh, education level, how much money people make, uh, racial and ethnic background, religious background, all sorts of interesting things. So you're going to get an inside look right at that neighborhood and um, as you're going around. I don't know about you, but when I'm driving around, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking at a place that I'm not familiar with, and I say, I wonder what kind of people live here. Would I, would I be a good fit? Would, would, are these my kind of people? Uh, would I fit in well here? And um, I think it's really interesting to go ahead and have this. So 
basically this is your little tool to look at the inside of a neighborhood without having to consult our website and with our indices you'll know right away is it affordable not affordable and we really spent a lot of time trying to figure out what data is most useful for instance are you comparing housing prices do we want to really compare housing prices with the entire U.S. when all we're doing is looking at a particular area, like a county or a metro area? Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about what is most insightful. Anyway, we're getting close to getting this um, uh, mobile app done. And uh, thanks to Jason and his great work that he's doing on it. It's going to be really interesting, fun to use, and insightful. So I think you'll really like that. So let's see. Let's see. Uh, I just had to laugh. I saw this. I saw this text. How do you keep your office so clean? Uh, that's a comment somebody put on our website. <laughs> um, I uh, well, I don't quite have everything tucked in one corner, but yeah, I tried to go ahead and keep it clean because I know people are going to be watching it, and uh, I don't want to look like um, too much of a slob. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I don't want to pan around the rest of the office and destroy the illusion that um, everything is is uh, all neat and in its place. But we all know what that's like, right? Um, so let's see what else we've got here. Um, we have a new. Let Let me go ahead and answer some of the things that we have here on our. our what I'm going to get back to some of the new features that we have on our website that we've been designing. Dana, uh, Dana Bridges, and Ben, and Al Olson in Vancouver, Washington. They're up. Part of our team they're working closely together and uh, they're coming up with some great new features uh, for everybody uh, we have a new compare feature that's going to be really really powerful and interactive you're going to have a lot of fun with that so uh, let's see what we are looking at as far as uh, type of things um, Will rent in will rent info be included on the mobile app? Well, by information, we're going to have comparable rental prices. There are some uh, very good rental prices out um, that the federal government has called fair market rents. Uh, sometimes having too much information can be kind of problematical. For instance, if you've seen these studies that come out and they say, "Oh, the rent last month went up three percent or something like that," that's pretty tough to quantify just on a month-to-month -month basis. So what we're doing is we're taking um, annual, we're uh, aggregating it for a year and giving and comparing the places against each other. So it's less about giving you the exact price because there are prices all over the city, all over the county, uh, where you would want to live. And, but it will be a great tool for comparing one rental area against another so yeah we're going to have uh, comp uh we'll give you what comparable prices for that area and of course you're going to have to do all the legwork and finding the place that's right for you whether you need a one bedroom place a studio or even a house so you'll be doing that to find what's best for you and what's available at that moment and but we might go ahead and partner with some places maybe like uh, Zillow or Redfin or whatever, uh, where they can present some of the homes that are available for rent or for sale that will give you some insight too. So we're happy to go ahead and partner with them if they provide good information for our people out there. Um, so let's see what else uh, we're going to have. Let me just take a look at... Um, so um, someone writes and says that, oh, well, first of all, what kind of home construction should we buy in Tornado Alley, Texas, such as Plano, Frisco, Selena? That's a good question. I'd be wrong. I have some ideas, but I don't want to steer you wrong because it often varies about your particular area. Now, I know down in Florida, uh, for hurricane construction, they have a lot of new standards that are being done. Uh, they're much more efficient than the older ones. Tornado, Tornado Alley, I don't have as much insight, and I don't want to steer you wrong. So I would talk to some of the folks uh, at FEMA or some of the emergency 
response places uh, about what is most effective and then find a builder that has done this before and in fact done it many times and more times. It's like going to a doctor. Uh, find a, find it a, a doctor or a builder that has done this many, many times before. They'll know what works for their area. For instance, we have a, a place on the Oregon coast and uh, for a remodel, we made sure to get a remodeler, a, a builder that was familiar with the conditions at the Oregon coast, which can be really uh, pretty brutal from a weather standpoint. And it's like that in Tornado Alley there in Texas. So you want to find a person who knows what's going on, knows the right material. Uh, anyway, talk to the folks who know, um, talk to friends and neighbors, and uh, talk to the emergency response people so they can give you the tips on what makes the most sense for you. So sorry, I couldn't be more specific, but if I did, I think I'd be steering you wrong. Nobody knows the area like local folks. Okay, let's see what else we have. Um, great, so my uh, Emerald Star is uh, viewing from Nashville. That, that's great. I had a great visit over there uh, last year, so I really enjoyed it. Um, let's see. Someone says, I'm currently living in Missouri. Can't stand the humidity. I'm looking for a place that has a drier climate, a lot of sun, is not so expensive uh, that I'm house poor. That's, you don't want to get over your head when it comes to buying housing. I'm also looking for somewhere that is diverse and liberal. Does such a place actually, actually exist? I love the idea of being able to walk to a local grocery store, farmer's market, and restaurants. Great. Well, everybody these days wants walkability, as they say. Everybody wants to have a place um that they can walk to the problem is these prices are or these places are really getting bid up prices are going up quite a bit so if you want to find a place that's affordable if you want to find a place that's drier if you want to find a place that's liberal and what did you term it um diverse and liberal i think you're probably talking about the west coast because and you want uh Basically what happens, the continental US uh, or the continental divide in the United States is the big backbone of the Rocky Mountains that's running from north to north and south, uh, dividing basically the west into the east. East of the continental divide, the Rockies, uh, which starts down in El Paso and goes all the way up to, um, to Montana, what will happen is uh, that you will go ahead and it'll be a lot moister because it basically captures all of the humidity from the big wet warm area that is the uh, Gulf of Mexico so it's going to be humid on the east going to be a lot drier on the west and if you want something that is um, say liberal you said and diverse uh, west coast is your bet and it's also going to be drier now the problem is you're going to find places that are going to be really expensive everything seems like on the west coast and the further west you go until you hit the coastline everything is more expensive so basically seattle increasingly portland uh portland's been discovered and um i'm not going to say bad things are happening but let's say it's changing a lot uh we're getting a lot more people in portland uh Housing prices are rising faster than almost every other place in the U.S. Uh, and um, uh, it's also becoming a lot more crowded. So there are issues uh, with that. S San Francisco, Seattle, uh, I mentioned Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, L.A., of course, all those are very expensive in comparison to the rest of the country. So you have an issue then about dryer and that sort of thing. I would look at Boise, Spokane, great things are happening there, Walla Walla, Washington as well. What you're doing is you're moving a little more inland in, and those are Washington and Idaho, uh, Coeur d'Alene area. Um, these are all smaller metro areas, uh, but they are really, I think, very cool places to live. Um, also, you might look at maybe Missoula, Montana, uh, and the problem, if you're going to move inland in California, get into the central, um, the central Valley, they are still recovering from 
the housing recession of 2007, 2008. Uh, yes, they're affordable, but as far the economy hasn't recovered very well at this point. Um, so as with everything, there are trade-offs. The more affordable places you're gonna find, they're gonna come with some of the issues uh, about maybe the economy is not as great as you'd want it to be. But uh, look at what's affordable for you so you don't get in over your head. Um, be smart about the whole thing and uh, look for some of those areas. Go to Sperlings uh, on bestplaces.net and we'll help you try and find some of those places. Oh, by the way, I want to tell you that we have a, a quiz on our site to help you. Uh, basically, it's an interactive quiz. Uh, you go on, tell us what you're looking for, and we try and provide you with some suggestions. Now, part, uh, we have, um, we had an earlier version in the last year. We've put on a shorter version. We've had a lot of uh, comments that people loved the previous version. The, the current version is good, and it does provide some insights and, and some gen general ideas which I think are very valuable in finding a place to start looking, but people really love maybe the longer version as well. So we're gonna be working on that here in the next few months. So come back to our site and look for that. We'll give you an update when we have this new version out. It's gonna be pretty amazing. Uh, and we'll do a lot of our indices to help you find uh, the best places. Uh, so come back, I'd love your input on that. So let's see what we have here as far as this. Um, someone is, let's see what we have here. I'm sorry, I'm just looking for some of the comments we got via email. Um, someone, Scott, is uh, trying to narrow down the short list, list of locations and he has a battle on his hands. He's basically, uh, he's looking at certain he has certain criteria that are non-negotiable, but um, he's feeling that because he's having these issues, he might be a little bit too rigid and he wants to open up his thinking a little bit. So he's looking uh, for land in an area that's reasonably priced with good air and water quality and low crime rate. Yeah, that's, those are very important things. I'm trying to balance the price and quality um, because cheap land is usually cheap or affordable for a reason. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I remember I created this study basically for uh, Money Magazine and worked with the editors for about 20 years finding the best places for their flagship study. And I remember the editor saying, Bert, can't, what about, don't we have a, a lot of great areas that no one else knows about? <laughs> and I had to laugh and I said, uh, Richard, if, if, if we, if nobody, uh, if there were great areas, uh, people would find out about it. And maybe you only have a few years before everybody else knows about it and then moves there and then it becomes either unaffordable or there are other, other issues involved. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the problem. Trying to find the big secret that nobody else knows about. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions for areas east or west of the Mississippi River? I'm looking for 50 plus acres. Uh, conscious of a possible water shortage area uh, in locations out west? Um, yes, uh, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, in fact, if you go, if you're interested in drought, if you're interested in really geeking out on drought data, uh, there is the Palmer Drought Index. If you do a search for that, the Palmer Drought Index, that will point you to a place on NOAA's site, NOAA, that's the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And the Palmer Index will give you both a short-term and a long-term look at the drought, measuring the current drought and also looking pretty far into the future about drought effects to give you an idea about what's going to happen. So like I said, if you want to geek out, lots of data about drought, um, look at the Palmer Hydrological Index uh, on the NOAA site, N-O-A-A. -A. Just do a search for the Palmer Drought Index and you'll get all the information. Uh, that's one of the things we use here on Sperlings to create some of the information uh, about that. And we're going to provide you more hooks into our data that you'll be able to download and then do your own studies 
um, and searches in a say Excel, Excel spreadsheet. So you can find places that might ordinarily be sort of hidden to you. So Scott, I know more about cities and such than I do about say places with 50 plus acres of land that you're not likely to find in many metro areas. So I don't have any great insights for you, but I think as far as something affordable, you're uh, in the heart of the country, I think you're being smart to look in those areas. I know as far as long-term drought, um, I was down in El Paso talking with the folks down there, and what they said was they are actually not concerned about uh, drought coming up. Uh, they have a very uh, deep aquifer that they're sitting on top of that shows no sign of decreasing. Things change, however, with climate change, and uh, so that might be a, a, an issue, but um, it's hard to tell what's coming up, which, by the way, um, I got sent a book to review called Climate Proof Your Personal Finances, and it's by David Stuckey. Uh, this book will be coming out soon. He asked me to take a look at it and tell me what he thought. I wrote uh, an endorsement for it, uh, one of those blurbs that you see, I think it's a really well-written book. Uh, in fact, it says here your your personal finances, but really it's a way to climate-proof your life. Uh, he goes into all sorts of detail about how climate change can impact you uh, and your finances, but most of all, your most important assets, and that is your home and your family. So he goes into all this information. It has lots of good sources, uh, points to a lot of information on the web. He also has a website. Now, the book is not long on um, graphs. It uh, doesn't have many maps, uh, tables, graphs. In fact, I would change maybe many to any. It doesn't have any maps uh, or graphs. And, you know, I didn't miss that. I didn't miss that because it's a lot of good text, a lot of good information. I'm looking forward to using some of the resources that he lists in my own research. Uh, he does a very good job. So if you're concerned about climate change and what it might do to you, where you live, and what it might do to your pocketbook, everything that you've worked hard to save up, I would recommend it. I think he's done a great job. That's Climate Proof Your Personal Finances by David Stuckey, S-T-O-O-K-E-Y. Anyway, I think it's very good, so I'm happy to recommend that. If you have anything, by the way, uh, that you find particularly interesting, uh, that you think that would be useful for me to take a look at uh, or review or whatever, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, there's so much good information out there these days. So let's see what we have as far as questions here. What's a good place in Phoenix, Arizona? Um, I've been in Phoenix. It is such a large area. There are, I'm sure, some really good places and maybe some places that are less challenging. Like every large metro area, you're going to find um, gems and you're going to find some places that uh, are maybe gems in the rough uh, that are really affordable because they're kind of rough and gritty. I'm not that familiar with Phoenix. I wish I could. Um, I know that there are a lot of upscale developments, and of course, it is beastly hot, as English would say. I mean, when you get temperatures in the summertime of 120 degrees, that's brutal, and that is even life-threatening, depending on how healthy you are. And in fact, I know that Phoenix is so hot during the summer that a lot of folks from Phoenix, uh, or all, just Arizona in general, go over to San Diego, where they're called zonies or zoners, uh, and they descend on the city of, of San Diego uh, and um, have apartments there or uh, will rent a place for a month or two just to escape the heat. Um, and in fact, I think I've heard that swimming pools actually get really hot, uh, so hot that they have coolers for the swimming pools. That is really hot. Too hot for me. But for some people, it's just right. And there are, um, Phoenix is an amazing metropolis in the middle of the desert. Um, myself, uh, Tucson, I think, is, is also really great. And Tucson has some of the cleanest air uh, in the U.S. So that's going to be very uh, valuable for some people as well. 
Um, so I'm really sorry, uh, I, Tony. I didn't have um, what is a good place. Uh, perhaps as I, I'm going to circle back to that, I'll look for some places that I might suggest. What I would do, because it's so large, I would look for maybe smaller towns that are within the Phoenix metro area. I don't know what your financial situation is or your um, family situation uh, or it's just you and your wife or whoever um, and what stage of life you are. But all of those have an influence. And what I'm finding is that um, it's really worthwhile if you can to sort of find move away from the areas that are less dense. As we read before, people, I think it was Scott was talking about, or um, someone was looking for, right, someone was looking for a place who's currently living in Missouri and wants a place that where he can walk to a local farmer's market, restaurants, that sort of thing. That's what people are looking for these days. And um, you're competing with them. So the less you compete with other people on where to live, uh, the more the better deal you're going to get as far as housing so i would look for places that are up and coming and uh you're going to win when it comes to finding an investment that is going to uh make money for you in the long run so let's see what else we have here um oh tony uh tony talks about peoria arizona or tolston arizona um I know I've had heard good things about Peoria, Peoria, Arizona, not so much about Tolston. And Tony says he's a single guy retiring in four years, wants to go to Phoenix. I've been there before in the canyons and loved it. So he wants to live there now. I think that's great. And Tony, great idea to go ahead and think about that now because, you know, he's going to be retiring, but Tony's still going to be young enough to do things like exploring canyons and doing things that might not be where he wants to end up in, say, 20 years when we all slow down uh, when we get in our 70s or so we slow down and maybe what fit us at as, as an earlier retiree we're not as active as we were before uh, we need things in a city that we might not get uh, in a city where we want to have fun and uh, do a lot of uh, active um, activities so Good for you, Tony. Just uh, and I'd like to everyone to realize really there are like three phases of retirement, uh, and the first years are like Tony wants to do uh, go there and explore around. You're going to be in the go-go years of retirement where you're running around and doing lots of fun things. You're maybe exploring the world. Uh, after a while, we get to the point where we maybe need some medical care on an ongoing basis. Uh, the joints in our knees give out, uh, those sorts of things. We're less likely to have that active lifestyle. We might want to actually start thinking about another place where we want, where we want to age in place. So those are places. Minneapolis has done a great job of that. Uh, there are other cities um, that have a infrastructure, uh, transportation, medical and otherwise. We have a study on our site uh, called The Best Places for Senior Living. We did it with Bankers Life. Go to our website, bestplaces.net, check it out. And um, But that has a lot of places that are a great place to think about sort of after the act of retirement, places that have the infrastructure and the uh, resources uh, for us to, as we get older in our life and need more help. And then finally, we reach a place where maybe we don't want to be around family. Family can help take care of us. Sort of if you, so you have the go-go years of retirement. You have the slow-go years as we start slowing down. And then finally, we have the no-go years where we're lucky just to get out of the house. And um, that's where we might want to be around family and friends more to give us a hand when we really need it. Uh, we'll, ha uh, we'll have problems uh, even getting outside for walking around a much and so we'll need a lot of help but think about that when you think about retirement you're not stuck where you are uh, for the first years of retirement you still have a lot of fun left ahead of you 
Okay, let's see. Um, I'm going to go to our some of the questions we got on our website uh, uh, via email. And uh, someone is moving next year and researching all the uh, counties and cities within the Northern California area near a Kaiser Permanente Hospital. That's a good thought. Um, problems I'm experiencing is data on many of the websites is outdated. Dated. Um, uh, let's see. The majority of the counties and cities rely on 2000 and 2010 census information. Yeah, that's true. Uh, how can users of your site and others be ensured that the information obtained is accurate and current for the, this fiscal year and there is no date mentioned uh, as to when you obtain the data? Yes, we have to do a better job. We're going to do that on our, on our uh, bestplaces.net website. Uh, we'll do a better job of identifying the data. Now, it's important to realize we can get the latest data today, but that data is going to be two years old. Because it takes that long, we have to, well, let's say we have 2014 comes along, or 2016. So we have the current year, we're going to get the data for 2016. Well, we have to wait for 2016 to actually end. So it's December, or let's say January 2017. The data is cut off. We have all the data available, and it goes all the way from January. Uh, so it's almost a year. Some of it's a year old to begin with, going from January to December. So January 2017, we have the 2016 data. It takes a full year for them to compile the data, process it, and then release it. So it's only being released uh, around November, December of 2017 for 2016. So then 2018 rolls around, that data is finally unpacked, um, processed by sites such as ourselves, and put out there. So it's really 2018 by the time you're getting 2016 data. That's why the current, the latest that you'll see right now is 2014 data from the census. And uh, there are some population estimates. For instance, we went through and carefully picked up population estimates from 2015. And that's going to be the most current information you're going to be able to see. Uh, there is some data like um, unemployment rate, uh, which is updated, and that lags about three months. But uh, basically, that's about the most current you're going to see. Uh, also, say, housing data from, say, Zillow, uh, they're going to lag about maybe four months or so. Uh, and they'll have information. They don't can't always get the most recent trends because what happens just month to month doesn't realize, reveal a larger trend until there's enough sort of backlog of data that you can see that happening. So I hope that gives you some ideas on on what actually happens and why. Um, but current data is there's no such thing uh, because it takes a while to process it and get it. Climate data, we can tell you, I, I think we can tell you if it's raining or not, but, uh, but that's about it. So let's see what else we have. Um, and that was someone in Alpine, California that was asking about that. Uh, I'd like to, um, Let's see, someone says, um, why do we have comments on our website uh, about different cities that are not very up to date? Uh, we, we have a large backlog of information about different places and we keep them. So what we'll do is we'll have a lot of um, comments from people that might be even three, four, five years old. Uh, I personally think that also provides a lot of insight now, if they're not reporting on, say, current housing prices or what the job market's like, something like that. But a lot of people are just commenting on what they find their own take on the quality of life. And I think that's really valuable. Uh, so we'll keep including those. We'll put the date on it so you can judge for yourself how valuable that is. Uh, but thanks for your question. I'm glad you're checking those comments out. They're really valuable. Which reminds me. Which reminds me. I know a lot about different places to live. 
with your help, with the comments that you provide and the investigation that we do, we get out on the road and we check out these places, by the way. I'm drinking today out of a very nice Hank Williams Museum coffee mug. We got this in Montgomery, Alabama at the Hank Williams Museum. That was a lot of fun. We got there late and they stayed open. They let us uh, poke around even after they had closed. So we really appreciate it. But one of the souvenirs I got. So as we're looking around Montgomery, Alabama and other places around the country, um, we're getting this information and we use it to inform what we know about a place. But tell you what, you're the expert where you live. Nobody knows where you live like you do because it's your hometown and you, every day, you know about what's going on there. So as regards to comments, I would love your comments about what it's like to live where you are. Go to our website, bestplaces.net, leave a comment. I would love it. And what you say informs me and what we do, our team, about whether or not the data is showing something accurate, what it's really like, um, and we can include those and pass them on to folks like we're doing right now. So please leave your comments at bestplaces.net because you're the expert where you are. So um, Ron writes, um, quality of life is utmost in everyone's mind when it comes to thinking about best places to live. But the combination of state and local taxes and crime rate is the reality statistic that makes quality of life possible, especially for those of us that are retired. Um, with taxes and crime rate as the overriding factor, where's the best place to live for retirees? Well, that's a tough one. Um, you know, and Ron, it really varies as far as your situation. For instance, do you get a lot of your um, income as far as investments, stocks, bonds, interest, whatever like that? Uh, looking at the updating the uh, most recent taxes, I believe Tennessee, for instance, taxes those things, but they don't have um, income taxes on other types of income. Uh, and there are other states where they don't tax pension, other states that do. Uh, some states have no income tax or no sales tax. Which is better for you? For instance, if, if a person doesn't have much income right now, you would rather live in a place that has an income tax. If you're retired, don't have really much of an income, but you don't want to be stuck paying an outsized portion of your, of your uh, resources, of, your, of the money that you have on sales taxes or say property taxes. If you own property, you don't want to pay a hefty property tax because you might be forced to sell your home uh, if you have to spend a, a lot on property tax if you don't have much coming in as far as income. Your situation varies. Go to our website. What we do is we look at the sales tax. We have sales tax all the way down, right down to the zip code. We have income taxes. Uh, we've gone into the tech for Ohio and Iowa. They have local income taxes. We've collected those as well as uh, the taxes, income taxes for the states as well. Uh, and we have property taxes as well. Uh, what you can expect to be, pay per thousand dollars of house valuation on um, any, every place in the United States. So we have that information. What's important to you? You can figure out what might be best for your particular situation. Crime rate is kind of tough. I believe that in every city in the U.S., there's good spots and bad spots uh, as far as crime. Uh, there are going to be places that are going to be uh, more problematical. What I have found is that crime is going to be lower in places with a better quality of life. Um, if you take out the crime, you're going to find lower crime in places that have a family structure. Um, that have, you know, the traditional family structure uh, where people have a higher income, where there is a, um, a higher level of employment, uh, where people are more educated. All of those mean that there's less reason for people to turn to crime and there's going to be less crime in that area. So that's why we have on our website a, how, uh, a crime risk index. 
with the crime risk index, then um, you can look at it and use some of those indicators that uh, we have that I've just uh, described to help identify the places that are most likely to have lower area rates of crime, in addition to the actual crime rates for about 9,000 9, cities around the U.S. from the FBI. So we have that information on our website. Um, that will help you make a, a, um, a guess, uh, or that will help you, not a guess, but it will help you define what you're looking for and give you a pretty good head start on finding the place that's best for you. So I hope that helps, and um, I know it's challenging. Let's see what else we have. Um, Someone, someone says, uh, I think, is it Newport or Newport, Tennessee? Uh, all towns have a history, and they feel that uh, Newport, Tennessee has the, some of the best local history. It has history, scenic beauty, nice people, a great country food, and moonshine. Well, I haven't tried their moonshine there, but um, I did have a lot of great food uh, when we took our 10,000-mile uh, jaunt through the Deep South. That was really great. Uh, I think we only had one meal. It was breakfast at McDonald's. I think I had an egg muffin. Couldn't find any place. I was, we were really hungry. We had to stop somewhere. That was our only chain food uh, in the entire trip. A wild chain. We did stop at um, uh, Waffle House a few times. That was a lot of fun. I enjoy, really enjoy the people that hang out there and some great conversations. Um, and they also have, go figure, they have Burt's Chili. I don't know how they ended up with Burt's Chili uh, on the menu at Waffle House, but I, I had to have some. It was pretty darn good. So, um, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed all the places. We had a lot of barbecue down south. We had a lot of uh, fried food, soul food. Uh, and um, it was really good. Totally different from what we get here in the Pacific Northwest, but that's a great thing about traveling. All sorts of different things. Um, so Michelle, uh, says, uh, my, um, no, I'm sorry. Mitchell says uh, my wife and I have been looking to relocate, relocate to Colorado from North of Georgia. Uh, they need to be within 45 minutes to an hour of most larger cities, such as Denver, Boulder, or Colorado Springs, um, relaxed in the area of Boulder and around Longmont and some areas around Colorado Springs, but they don't want to be too close to airports due to the air noise. And due to health reasons, they can't get high up in elevations. Yeah, that is a problem. If you're talking about Colorado, mile high, that's um, uh, be interesting to know. On our website, bestplaces.net, we do have elevations for all the places. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, we're hoping to find a home between 350000 to $550,000 and with at least a three-quarter acre or larger lot um, with some uh, property. Uh, do you have any suggestions what, which would be good fit? Well, I don't know what altitude, what elevation that you're talking about exactly. Uh, of course, everything in the Denver area, Colorado Springs, is going to be pretty high. That's going to be an issue. Denver is growing a lot. It's a lot like Portland. I think Portland and Denver are almost like sister cities. People are discovering it as being a great, affordable place to live. Uh, with the type of lot that you're talking about, it's going to have to be somewhere on the outskirts of town. Um, I know that between Boulder, Boulder's getting crazy expensive, by the way. Uh, Boulder, probably the healthiest uh, place as far as its residents uh, in the U.S. Um, part of what makes it healthy is that healthy people go there to be in the outdoor activities. So really, it's sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing, if you get what I'm saying. Uh, but Boulder is getting crazy expensive. Um, I found that the area between Boulder and uh, Denver is really nice. It's getting built up. I think it's pretty well discovered. There's Louisville, Colorado. Uh, that is a really nice town. It has a nice little downtown and everything. I'm afraid I've maybe spoiled it in some way. I've uh, picked it several times as one of the top 10 places to live. And uh, it's a great family spot. Uh, but I think that um, maybe the secret is out about Louisville. So, uh, but you might look at the area between Boulder and Denver. And Colorado Springs, um, 
I think is also a pretty good spot. Uh, but I, um, I think somewhere around the Boulder area, the question is if the elevation is too high. Uh, so anyway, I would look at that outskirts of town are great. You also then don't have to compete with people that want a short commute. Um, let's see. We're going to go ahead and go here and look at some other things that we have. Um, long, long, long. I really can't go ahead and summarize too easily. Um, someone is asking about our climate data. Um, and that's a, a really good question. We ha are spending a lot of time upgrading our climate information. Uh, part of what the issue is, is that there, for snow data, for instance, there are not, um, there are not very many snow stations that measure snow. And you can have places within a few miles of a, of a weather station that can be different in elevation. Uh, and you get a completely wrong reading. What we're doing is with the help of Nick Arnold, our uh, geography, uh, our GIS guy, that means mapping, cartography, and uh, Nick is also a whiz when it comes to um, climatology as well. So with Nick's help, we're going to be looking at the snow stations and then doing something called a spatial analysis, looking at factoring elevation in there as well so that we can accurately model uh, where snow is most likely to occur. So we've done some work on that. We think we're most of the way there, but uh, we're going to do some further analysis and put us over the top. Oh, by the way, let me just tell you what we do, for instance. I talked about sales taxes. Here's what we do. For instance, like metro area, what would be like the average sales tax for a city or a metro area? Well, the problem is like with a metro area, um, it could be several states. Uh, and they all have different say, jurisdictions. What we do is we find the population in that in each of the zip codes and weight that accordingly, and then we pick out the the sales tax that is affects the most people within that metro area. So that's the kind of work that we do instead of just averaging all together and ending up with a sales tax that no one has ever seen in that area. We do sort of the legwork behind the scenes to find the one that is predominant for the most people in that area. So that's the kind of uh, thing that we do to, to help you find information that is pretty useful. Uh, let's see what else we have. <clears throat> how, um, how, where do we get your, uh, your data and how do you create your rating system? Uh, are you counting information for just the city or the whole country? Uh, um, or the whole county for cities such as Sarasota, Florida? That's a good question. We've spent a lot of time on our rating system. You're going to see a lot more ratings on our website, which take the data and sort of distill it, make sense of it, so you have an idea on a scale of 1 to 10, how affordable is a place, what's the climate like, and so on. So to give you an idea, for instance, in housing prices, are we can does it make sense to really compare that housing price for affordability with say New York City if you're looking at Sarasota Florida we think it doesn't so we're going to be comparing those housing prices within the area that you're looking at so it would be within the Sarasota metro area because if you're if you're looking at Sarasota you'll want to know how that compares with other places in that area um, so if there are other counties or nearby areas around Sarasota that are more affordable, you want to know that. You don't really care what it's like in, say, Denver or Los Angeles. So that's the kind of type of thing that we're wrestling with to make it more uh, interesting and insightful for you. So we're getting close to winding it up here. Uh, gee, the hour has just flown by. As you can tell, I love to talk about this sort of stuff. Thanks for the questions. I really appreciate it. Um, Come to our uh, website, bestplaces.net. We're changing things every day on it. Uh, send us your comments about what you'd like to see, what you find useful. Uh, we've gotten some great compliments, by the way, I didn't get into, uh, that uh, where we've helped people. And uh, like I said, you are the expert where you live. 
And I'd love to hear from you uh, and what you find to be really interesting about where you live and share it with other people. So once again, this is Bert Sperling uh, with bestplaces.net and uh, hoping you have a great month coming up here in September and uh, hope the climate's good. And uh, we'll talk to you next month, this time about best places. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye.